the House, Mr order. Speaker. Order. Labor is not opposed to the The idea. debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 97. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. The member will have leave to continue speaking when the debate is resumed. The Honourable the Acting Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I inform the House that the Minister for Small Business and Tourism uh, will be absent from question time today. She's in Sydney on official business. And the Minister for Trade will answer questions on her behalf. Questions? Are there any questions? The Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And my, my question is to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Minister, will the government release Order. in Senate estimates today the full statistical details of the protected award conditions removed from Australian workplace agreements? The Honourable Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. And I note that in 1996 the unemployment rate in her electorate was 9.7 per cent. Today it's 5.6 per cent. That's good news. Mr Speaker, um, when it comes to individual agreements, we believe they are between the employer and the employee, and that's the way it should stay. The Honourable Member for O'Connor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Would the Minister inform the House about plans for a new United States communication facility in Western Australia and the contribution this will make to the Australia-United States alliance and the economy of the town of Geraldton in my electorate? Is he aware of any alternative views? The Honourable the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Well, Mr. Speaker, first, can I thank the Honourable Member for O'Connor for his question. As a Western Australian member, I know he would be particularly interested that the government has agreed to host at Geraldton a ground station for a United States military communications system, which is known as Mobile User Objective System, and it will be hosted on the same basis as all other. Um, Australia-US joint facilities uh, and operate on the basis of our full knowledge and our full concurrence. Um, so, Mr Speaker, these arrangements apply at Pine Gap and the Joint Geological and Geophysical Research Station, which are both near Alice Springs, and also at the Naval Communications Station, the Harold E. Holt Communications Station at Exmouth, where the US also has access. These facilities in the new mobile user objective system are fundamental in underpinning and giving practical effect um, in a very practical way to the United States alliance. And the government, Mr Speaker, is strongly committed to the alliance as the key guarantee to our nation's security. Mr Speaker, I would have assumed, I would have assumed that the Labor Party would welcome um, this initiative. But, Mr Speaker, this morning when Labor spokesmen were asked about it, um, their response was silence. Labor spokesmen did not come out and uh, embrace, embrace this initiative as we would have expected. The Labor environment spokesman, the member for Kingsford Smith, Mr Speaker, was asked on five occasions, on five occasions at a press conference this morning whether he supported this facility. On five occasions, the member for Kingsford Smith refused to answer. And indeed, Mr. Speaker, it is interesting that the members for Perth, the member for Lilly, the member for Lawler, after all, the deputy leader of the Labor Party, and the member for Grainler, they all refused to answer a question, all refused to answer a question and give endorsement to this particular proposal. Now, Mr. Speaker, Labor members are always happy to give their views on anything, and they have been urged by the Leader of the Opposition um, to do what he used to do, and that is just talk endlessly in the media. But, Mr Speaker, uh, one journalist said to the member for uh, Kingsford Smith, but you've sung songs before about your opposition to US bases on Australian so soil. Have your views Order. changed since then? And, Mr Speaker, he says, my views are clear. 
and they have been clear since I have been in Parliament. I am here as a member of the Labor Party and to talk Labor policy, but never an endorsement, of course, of this joint uh, facility, never an endorsement of these bases. Mr Speaker, um, let, let's be absolutely frank about this. The member for Kingsford Smith was always a supporter of the closure of American bases in Australia, always. Uh, there he was up there at Alice Springs in the 1980s um, with his you know, fellow travellers demanding that Pine Gap in 1980s, demanding that Pine Gap be closed, close all the joint facilities. A great Order. man of principle. Order. A great man of principle. Um, US forces give the nod. It's a setback for your country. Order. The member for Morton. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member for the, Morton. The simple fact is, the simple fact is that the Labor Party, the Labor Party thinks that the United States should be defeated in Iraq. It thinks that these joint facilities are really not acceptable in Australia, and yet the Leader of the Opposition tries to Order. pretend that he is a supporter of the US alliance. Mr Speaker, it is typical of Labor under the Leader of the Opposition. It plays all ends against the middle. The Hon. the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is again to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. I refer the Minister to his last answer, in which he said employment agreements were a matter for employers and employees. Why then does the government require AWAs to be lodged at the Office of the Employment Advocate? The Hon. Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. They're lodged, Mr. Speaker, to, to ensure that they comply with the laws. And the protections that we put in place in legislation Order. are to protect Order. employees. Now, I'll just make this point, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The de uh, Mr. Speaker, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition wants to see every AWA. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition and her union mates want to have a look at every employment agreement between an employer and an employee. And, and that is Order. exactly the way they do it. Greg Combe billed the cat this week when he said uh, that uh, the agreements that they were opposed to were not only AWAs but non-union agreements as well. That the trade union movement wants to be there for every negotiation between an employer and an employee. And Mr Speaker, we believe in freedom of choice. We believe Order. in the opportunity Order. for the individual Order. The to control their the own question. destiny. That's what we believe in, Mr Speaker. We believe that individuals have the capacity to negotiate on their own behalf in a whole range of areas, buying a house, buying a car, uh, in entering into an employment contract, even raising children. We believe individuals have the capacity to undertake those sorts of responsibilities, and we don't believe the union movement should have a role in every workplace agreement. The honourable member for Kalgoorlie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Defence. Given that the government is negotiating with the United States for a joint communications facility at Geraldton in Western Australia, what is the purpose of this facility, and are there any alternative policies? The Honourable the Minister for Defence. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, I thank the member for Kalgoorlie for his uh, question and very strong support for defence facilities in the state of Western Australia. Uh, Mr Speaker, I can confirm that for some two years now the Australian government has been negotiating with the United States an agreement to see that a number of uh, ground-based uh, satellite communication systems are placed in appropriate locations in Australia. The first one, which has not yet been finally agreed but we expect to conclude in the next few months, is for an unmanned ground-based facility at Geraldton, which will be a ground-based satellite communications uh, system for the United States military and its allies. And for reasons I'd expect the House to appreciate, I won't go into the specific details, but it will support not only the operations of the United States military and its allies, but also support Australian troops. It will, as the Foreign Minister said, uh, be conducted with the full knowledge and concurrence uh, of the Australian Government. In other words, we will be fully aware of uh, the information that goes through that uh, ground-based uh, system. 
We are also negotiating for another, a number of other ground-based uh, facilities which will have a non-military use. Mr. Speaker, the United States-Australia alliance is extremely important. It is not just about friendship, but it is also about our capability, our military capability, intelligence sharing, the interoperability between our two militaries and, of course, the security of Australia, our people, our interests and our values. I am asked about uh, alternative views, Mr Speaker. The Australian National University conducts a survey every federal election, and what it does is it asks the candidates who are seeking to be elected to the federal parliament their views on a number of issues. And it's interesting, in 2004, Mr Speaker, the Australian National University asked, amongst its questions, it asked the question, is the United States a threat to Australia's security? Now, it's rather extraordinary that uh, anyone would Order. think that the need to ask such a question, but nonetheless the ANU asked people standing for election to the federal parliament if they thought that the United States, Australia's key ally, Order. is a threat to Australia's security. And, uh, Mr Speaker, I was staggered to read that 22 per cent, one in four, one in four Order, the member for candidates standing for election for the Australian Labor Party believe Order, that the, the United States is a threat to Australia's security. What that means, Mr Speaker, that as we on this side look Order, to the member that for side, Rankin. we know that every fourth person on average believes the United States is a threat to the security Order. of Australia. Order. But, Mr Speaker, I also noticed this morning the the member Foreign for Swan. Minister uh, reminded us that this morning the member for Kingsford Smith was one of five Labor Party front benches who was asked whether they support the unmanned ground-based military facility for Geraldton. And I noticed that the member for Kingsford Smith was asked not once or twice but five times whether he supported it. And uh, he was asked whether he'd sung about it. Well, he has sung about it, but he's also written about it. Order. So, Mr Speaker, I, I went to the uh, library and I obtained a book called Peter Garrett, Political Blues. And when choosing books, Mr order. Speaker, I... Order, order. The minister resume his seat. The member for Grainler on a point of order. Standing order 104, Mr Speaker. The member will resume his seat. I think the minister is entirely in order. The, mem the minister is answering the question. Uh, I having, call the minister. Uh, Having examined the front of the book, I then went to the back and uh, Order. I, uh, I, the member uh, for Melbourne Port. I thought it important to have a pricey of the book, and uh, it says, "In political blues, he—that's Peter Garrett—confronts us with the issues Order. on which it is time for us to make a stand." So these, uh, Mr. Speaker, Order. the member for Kingsford Smith felt so the strongly. The member for Melbourne Ports is warned. The member for Kingsford Smith felt so strongly about these issues, he didn't write a letter, he didn't produce a pamphlet, the he wrote a book. The member for Watson is also warned. And he wrote a book called Peter Garrett, quite an imaginative title, about the things upon which it is now time to take order, a stand. Order, order, The minister resume his seat. The member for Wills on the point of order. Yes, Mr Speaker. The minister was asked about the facility at Geraldton, not when the he was member a member of the Labor Party. Can you bring seat. him back to the question? The member resume his seat. If the member wishes to take a point of order, he will come straight to the point of order and not debate it. I call the minister, but given that uh, he's already given a lengthy answer, he might come bring his Speaker, answer to uh, conclusion. I turned uh, in the book to page 95 in relation to US facilities in Australia, and uh, the member for Kingsford Smith said this, and I quote, I look forward to the day when the eviction notices are formally presented to the American Secretary of State by the elected leader of the Australian Order. people. So, Mr Speaker, in fact, he also said of the US Secretary of Navy, he criticised him, he said, because, and I quote, he believes in winning wars. So, Mr Speaker, the alternative government of Australia has one in four people in Order. its ranks that believes the United States is a threat to the security of Australia. There are five front benches that will not support a US-based facility to support our the troops as much Chief as their own. Whip. 
and also has a front bencher that is looking forward to the day when the leader of Australia evicts the United States and its facilities from this country. Mr. Mr. Speaker, it's time that the Labor Party stood up for Australia and the Australia-US alliance Order. Order. and Australia's best interests. Yeah. Yeah. Order, members on my right. The member for Sturt. The Attorney General. Members are holding up their own question time. The Chief Opposition Whip. The Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Isn't it a fact that the only reason the Minister won't use his power to direct the OEA to provide statistical information—not personal details—statistical information on what is happening to wages and conditions under the government's AWAs is because it doesn't want Australians to know the truth. Minister, how can you justify this cover-up? The Honourable Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. No. No, you can't justify the cover-up, sir. You can't justify the cover-up. Order. The Honourable Member for Greenway. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Treasurer. Would the Treasurer update the House on the progress of the Australian Securities and Investment Commission in relation to matters arising from the Jackson inquiry? The Honourable Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Greenway for her question. I think all members of the House would welcome the fact that the James Hardy company has now recognised its liability to those suffering from uh, asbestos-related diseases, and shareholders have now approved uh, financial arrangements which should enable uh, the company to meet its just liabilities. Uh, Mr Speaker, just liabilities which the company should never have sought to avoid uh, when it entered into a very complicated uh, arrangement to remove itself to the Netherlands. Uh, Mr Speaker, I can inform the House uh, today that the Australian Securities and Investment Commission has now commenced civil action against the company and a number of former and current directors and executives. Uh, these proceedings, Mr Speaker, should not affect the compensation arrangements in any respect whatsoever. But the proceedings which have been taken by the Australian Securities and Investment Commission uh, seek uh, pecuniary penalties up to a maximum of $200,000 per breach, and the regulator is asking the court to consider banning individuals from acting as company directors in the future. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, of course these are just proceedings at this point, and uh, under our legal system, uh, anybody is entitled to the presumption of uh, innocence. But I want to uh, remind the House that the government uh, has been very, very clear about the necessity to bring to justice anybody who may have been in breach of the Corporations Act. Indeed, that's the reason why the government gave $7.5 million to fund this investigation. It's why the government passed the James Hardy Investigation and Proceedings Act of 2004 so that evidence could go to uh, ASIC from the Jackson inquiry, and it's a consequence of those measures that these proceedings have now been taken. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, members will recall that uh, it was proposed by the New South Wales government that uh, it would give a release to the directors of James Hardy 
so they would not be required to face proceedings of this kind. And members of the House will recall me raising that matter in this House and the Commonwealth opposing it. Uh, fortunately, we were successful in preventing the New South Wales government from doing any such thing, and if it had done any such thing, these proceedings could not have been brought. Uh, and in fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, I should uh, say that I got a uh, letter from the uh, CFMEU the State Secretary for New South Wales as recently as yesterday asking me what the Commonwealth Government was doing about this investigation, Mr Andrew Ferguson, uh, well known to people in this House. Uh, and I can say uh, now it is clear what the Commonwealth was doing about it. And uh, I should mention in passing, if the Commonwealth hadn't been on the job, the New South Wales Government would have given releases to prevent these actions from being taken. Uh, and I think Mr Andrew Ferguson would be uh, uh, very pleased that the Commonwealth Government was on the job preventing the New South Wales Labor Government from what it then proposed. And I also uh, mention in passing, uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, that uh, Federal Labor, uh, uh, as recently as a few months ago, was proposing a new tax break for James Hardy, a company-specific tax break for uh, James Hardy to give it uh, an improved financial position to meet its just liabilities. Uh, that was being proposed by the member for Hunter with uh, amendments uh, in this House. Uh, can I say, Mr Speaker, this company never deserved a company-specific tax break. This company should have and now has been brought to its just liabilities without any tax privileges, as was proposed by the Federal Labor Party. And these proceedings have now been brought without any releases, as was proposed by the New South Wales Labor government. Mr Speaker, uh, that was an ask from James Hardy, a piece of brinkmanship uh, which it tried to pull on, just as it tried to pull Order. on Order. the removal of the liability by a complicated relocation to the Netherlands. Can I say, as this government has made clear all along, we believe those that may have breached their uh, corporate law obligations should be brought to court, and these proceedings will do that. The Honourable Member for Kingsford Smith. Order. 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 Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Why hasn't the Treasurer's Department modelled the potential impacts of climate change on the Australian economy? The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, because um, numerous reports have been done on it by the Department of the Environment and Heritage, Order. Order. the Australian Greenhouse Office, the CSIRO, by the Australian Bureau Order. of Order. Agricultural Order. Resources and by the Bureau of Meteorology. Mr. Speaker. The uh, Treasury, of course, has not uh, constructed a model in relation to climate change, but as part of its role in advising the government, has undertaken extensive qualitative analysis of all the global literature in relation to this matter, including, of course, the UK government's Stern Review and the IPCC assessments. The Stern Review uses an integrated assessment model to make projections of the global impact of climate change. As far as the Treasury is aware, no country, no country has developed a model of national consequences. All of the models that have been developed are in relation to global consequences, Mr Speaker. The Stern Review itself says as follows. Making estimates is a formidable task, is computationally demanding, with the results that models must make drastic, often heroic simplifications along all stages of the climate change chain. Uh, what is more, large uncertainties are associated with each element in the cycle. Now, Mr Speaker, that doesn't uh, mean that it's not worth doing, and I think the Stern report 
was worth doing, although, as I previously informed the House, as a well, as Order. I previously, Mr. Speaker, the member for Grainlers had one of those enlightened moments. <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker, Order. as I Order. previously informed Order. the House, well worth Order. doing. Although the Treasury, as it's given uh, evidence in relation to the matter, had serious disagreements with the way in which it was uh, which it was done. Uh, and, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think I'd be uh, correct in saying the UK Treasury itself had some serious disagreements with the stern inquiry, Mr. Speaker. But that uh, doesn't mean it wasn't worth doing. It most definitely was worth doing. And the assessments that the Treasury have done in relation to that, uh, uh, in fact, profited from that. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, if somebody is going to go on from that and say that the government hasn't done uh, any work, uh, they would be seriously wrong. Um, I can't uh, help uh, leaving this question without observing, Mr. Speaker, that the member for Kingsford Smith called a press conference on, uh, on this uh, very issue today. And uh, after making a rather long introductory uh, statement, Mr. Speaker, uh, he was asked this question. Peter, you're well known, view, well known for your views on the US alliance. How do you feel about a new base in Western Australia near Geraldton? Answer. Well, what you may well say, what's this got to do with the question? Order, order, because, order. Because order. here was the answer. Order. The, the Treasurer will get on with his answer. Here was the answer. How do you feel about a new base in Western Australia? Garrett, answer. I'm astonished the Treasurer hasn't had his eye on the ball for climate change, Mr Speaker. That was very relevant, Mr Speaker. Uh, next question. Uh, putting climate change aside, do you have concerns about a new US communication base at Geraldton? Garrett, answer. I am here to remind Australians the Howard government has taken its hands off the wheel in relation to climate change. Uh, next, um, Mr Garrett. Have you shared your previous views on US bases on Australian soil? Answer. Appropriate shadows will respond to that question, Mr Speaker. Next question. Why don't you tell us what you think about this US base? Well, I'm listening carefully Answer. to Answer. I want to tell you what I think about climate change today, Mr Speaker. Well, 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 the Treasurer resumes. As the Treasurer resumes, sir. The Honourable Manager of Opposition Business, on a point of order. The obvious standing order 104 is in breach, the, Mr. Speaker. The member will resume his seat. I'm listening careful, carefully to the Treasurer. It would appear that this, uh, he's quoting from an interview that had something to do with climate change, which I think was a, the point of the question. I call the Treasurer, but given the time, I hope he's drawing his. Uh, Mr. I've, conclusion. I'm, I'm, I'm nearly Order. through the end, Mr. Speaker. I've, I've gone through the four denials and I'm up to the fifth. So let me give you the last one. But you've sung songs before about your opposition to US bases on Australian soil. Have your views changed? Garrett, my views are clear and have been clear since I came into the parliament. <laughs> I'm here as a member of the Labor Party to talk about Labor policy. Well, Mr. Speaker. Let me, make, uh, let me make this observation. Order. Let me make Order. this observation. Whereas Order. the Labor Party can't bring itself to have a position, Mr. Speaker, on, uh, on this base at Geraldton, they don't have much trouble in getting a position on Hugo Chavez and Venezuela, Mr. Right. Speaker. They're Treasurer, much more Treasurer interested in the latter than the former. The Treasurer will resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Maranoa. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Would the Minister inform the House of the government's stance on supporting the democratic government in Iraq, and would, would the Minister advise the House as to whether there are any other views? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Well, Mr. Speaker, first let me tell the Honourable Member, and I'm sure he doesn't need any reassurance of this, that the Australian government stands by the brave people of Iraq. Mr Speaker, between 10, and 12 million, between 10 and 12 million Iraqis defied terrorists on three occasions to go and vote to reclaim their own the future. The member for Chipley is warned. 
And so, Mr. Speaker, we are certainly committed to those people, not to the terrorists and the insurgents and the militias, but to the vast majority of the Iraqi people who obviously want a more peaceful life and certainly have voted for a more democratic life than they had under Saddam Hussein. And, Mr. Speaker, we're making a good contribution in a number of different ways in Iraq. Now, the Honourable uh, Member asked whether there are any other positions. Mr. Speaker, my observation of the Leader of the Opposition over the years, um, when he was the spokesman on foreign affairs, is that the Leader of the Opposition has never held a strong position for more than a few days at a time. He will only hold a position for as long as it's popular, and when that ceases to be popular, he'll move to another position. He is all things to all people. That's my observation, Mr Speaker. He's getting a good run, of course, from the media at the moment, but once he comes under scrutiny, once he comes under scrutiny I think that that will be exposed. Let's just take the whole issue that this question is about, the troops in Iraq. In, 2003, in November 2003, the Leader of the Opposition wrote to the Prime Minister and he said, now that regi regime change has occurred in Baghdad, which uh, privately I think he may have been pleased about but Labor was opposed to, it is the opposition's view that it is now the responsibility of all people of goodwill, both in this country, Australia, and beyond, to put their shoulder to the wheel in an effort to build a new Iraq. So the Leader of the Opposition thought we should get in there, we had a responsibility, and we should help secure Iraq and a future for the people of Iraq. Good. Well, I agreed with that, Mr Speaker. In 2004, I mean, actually, this is only a few months later, and the opposition starts running some campaign about troops out by Christmas. He said, our objective is to have troops out by Christmas. So a few months earlier, he was in favour of getting in there and helping. Um, it gets to uh, May, I think, of that year, 2004, and it's troops out. Now, what is the position today of the leader of the opposition on this issue? Well, Mr Speaker, when he was asked on Meet the Press on Channel 10 on Sunday, uh, would troops be out by Christmas, having been in favour of that position, of course in 2004, we've got to 2007, his answer is, of course not. If I become Prime Minister, I'd establish early contact with the administration, that's the US administration, and talk about how that was best done. I don't intend to leave our ally immediately in the lurch. So, Mr. Speaker, what is all this about? What is all this about, Mr. Speaker? When you forensically dig into the position of the leader of the opposition, this is Labor's position. Labor believes we should pull out the 500 troops in the Overwatch Battle Group of the Overwatch Battle Group in Dikar Province. We should pull them out, but only if there's somebody else who can be found to fill the gap. So that is troops out. So the Leader of the Opposition can tell all people in Australia who are in favour of troops out that he's in favour of troops out. What doesn't he tell those people? He doesn't tell those people that not only does he believe the security detachment Order. should remain in Baghdad, which is reasonable, I'm not making an argument about that, but he also believes that the 200 or so um, uh, sailors on HMAS Toowoomba should remain in Iraqi waters protecting oil platforms. He believes that the 140 Australians who support the C-130s in and around uh, Iraq, that should remain. He believes that the P-3C aircraft and the 170 who go with them, they should all remain. Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition's position, far from being clear as some people are trying to claim, the Leader of the Opposition's position is that of the 1,400 people we have in Iraq, Labor might, might take out 500 of them if somebody can be found to fill the gap, and the other 900 would all remain in Iraq. And Labor's position, Mr Speaker, is always also, is also very interestingly, that repeated you know, yesterday by the Leader of the Opposition, that the Americans should get out of Iraq, I mean in defeat and ignominy. Uh, so, Mr Speaker, what is the position of the Leader of the Opposition? The answer is his position as usual, as usual, as usual, his position is Order. every position. Order. The member if for you're Sydney. in favour of sticking up for the Iraqis, the Leader of the Opposition has a policy for you. If you're opposed to it, 
the Leader of the Opposition has a policy for you. If you want troops in Iraq, yes, he can deliver that. If you don't, yes, he can deliver that. If you support the Americans, yes, he can do that. You support the insurgents and the terrorists and so on. Uh, yes, he can deliver that as well, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this country deserves a leader of the opposition with a bit of strength, a bit of commitment, and here we have a leader of the opposition who vacillates and, in a populist crusade, tries to find a position that will suit absolutely everybody. The honourable member for Lilly. Order. Order. The member for Lilly has the call. My question is to the Treasurer and Acting Leader of the Liberal Party. I refer the Treasurer to a report by Glenn Milne on Monday, February 12, in The Australian, where Mr Milne wrote, and I quote, No wonder Peter the Costello Minister. is telling anyone who will listen behind the back of his hand that it might not be such a bad thing if the economy hits a few bumps to put voter apprehension back into the election mix. Given that the Treasurer's parents always taught him to always tell the truth, can he confirm there is any truth to Mr Milne's report or any other reports about what he is up to at the moment? Order. Honourable, the Honourable the Treasurer. Order. The well, Treasurer has the call. Well, Mr Speaker, I suppose that is the best he can do. Uh, here we are. We've, uh, not bad, he says. Not bad. Here we are. We're in the second week of this sitting. He bowls up. He hasn't asked a us a question about business. jobs or interest rates or infrastructure the or member tax. For Lilly has asked his and that's question. the best he can bowl the up. Member for Lilly has oh, asked his Speaker, question. Of him, I can only think of one description. Some mothers do have them, Mr Speaker. And we're very glad your mother did. The member for Lilly so. is warned. And we would like you the to member stay for precisely Lilly is where warned. you are. Mr. Speaker, now um, can I say, in relation to the economy, this is not a econo an economy which runs itself. This is a one trillion dollar economy. And during the period in which I've been the treasurer of this country, the treasurer resumed his seat. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. 104, Mr. Speaker. The Treasurer is in, entirely in order, and I say, to, and I say to the, I say to the member, if he continues to take frivolous points of order, I will take further action. The honourable the treasurer, uh, Mr. Speaker, and during the period in which I've been treasurer, there's been a great deal of risk in the Australian economy, and we had to take the Australian economy through the Asian financial crisis. We had to take the Australian economy through the U.S. recession. We had to take it through September the 11th and war. We had to take it through SARS. We had to take it through the worst drought in 100 years, Mr. Speaker. Order. And all of the way as we took it Jagger, through Jagger. all of those risks, and one of those risks is very much on the on the board at the moment, the drought which Australia is suffering from. And all of the way, in all of those risks, this government had to do the heavy lifting, Mr. Speaker. The treasurer, this, treasurer resume his seat. The, Member for Wills, is this a point of order? Yes, Mr. Speaker. The Treasurer was asked whether Glenn the member Mills for Wills report resume his seat. The member for Wills resume his seat. The member for Wills knows that if he is to take a point of order, he gets straight to his point of order. He does not debate it. I have been listening closely to the Treasurer. He is entirely in order, and I will take action if there continues to be frivolous points of order. Speaker, I'm, asked about, I'm asked about risk in the Australian economy, and the point I'm making is there's a lot of risk in the Australian economy. There's, there's so much risk in the Australian economy the member that, it, for is warned. that the Australian economy has to be managed. And let me let the House into another secret. There is so much risk in the Australian economy that Australia cannot afford the member for Lilly as the Treasurer. There is so much risk in the Australian economy we can't have a nouveau for Prime Minister. The honourable member for Melbourne on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the Treasurer has asked whether the or not he made Melbourne a particular statement. He has refused the to answer Melbourne the question. He, he will resume his seat. He, the Treasurer is entirely in order, and I warn the member for Melbourne. The Treasurer. The member for Melbourne was asked to come to his point of order. He did not come to his point of order. He was debating, he was trying to debate the Treasurer. 
The Honourable Member for Melbourne. Mr Speaker, could you please explain on what basis you've given that warning? I've made the a point of order. I raised a specific point. The Member for Melbourne has given his seat. The Member for Melbourne will remove himself under Standing Order 94A. The Honourable the Treasurer. And so, Mr. Speaker, let me say uh, there's a lot of risk in the Australian economy. Mr. Speaker, it's true that the Australian economy has weathered that risk a lot better under the coalition management than it was 10 years ago. But if anybody in Australia thinks that you can walk people in to manage this Australian economy on the basis that they once ran a cabinet office in Queensland, Mr. Speaker, on the basis, Mr. Order. Speaker, that they Order. were once an ALP state the secretary in Queensland, they are wrong. Economic management is much too important to be left to the Labor Party. Yeah. Has the Treasurer completed his answer? The Treasurer has completed his answer. The, the member for Lily. The member for Lily does not have the call. The honourable member for Bonner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. The member for Bonner has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Would the minister inform the House how public hospitals are performing under the Australian health care agreements? Are the state public hospitals performing as well as the Australian public has a right to expect? Are there any alternative policies, and what is the government's response? The Honourable Minister for Health and Ageing. Well, Mr Speaker, I do thank the uh, member for Bonner for his question, and I can inform uh, him that over the life of the current health care agreements, uh, the Commonwealth uh, will provide $42 billion uh, to the states uh, for public hospital services, which is a 17 per cent real increase uh, over the previous agreements. Uh, and that $42 billion includes $8 billion uh, for public hospitals in Queensland, which is a 21 per cent real increase. So, Mr Speaker, the Commonwealth has increased its funding, and uh, Mr Speaker, let's give credit where it's due. The states Order. have also increased their funding. In fact, the states have increased their funding more. And you know, Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition likes to attack the blame game. The one thing the blame game has done, it's shamed the states. It shamed the states into finally spending what they need to spend on their public hospitals. And Mr. Speaker, Order. thanks to this increased spending, thanks to this increased spending, there are now 54,000 public hospital beds in this country. There are now 2,400 more public hospital beds than in 2004. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition might think we are living under the jackboot heel of Howard's Brutopia. But at least we've got more hospital beds, Mr Speaker, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks to the policies of the Howard government. The Leader of the Opposition said the other day, and I quote, Remember, I worked in Queensland from 88 really until 96, purely on schools, hospitals, water, environment, land rights, law and order. That was the bread and butter of my daily life. And he said, Mr Speaker, and he turns his back now because he doesn't like to be reminded of the silly things he said. He says the thing about state government oh, is that people legitimately demand performance. So, Mr. Speaker, I thought, how was this golden age? How was this golden age of Christian socialism in Queensland, Mr. Speaker? And I discover that when the leader of the opposition was the de facto premier of Queensland, three operating theatres at the Princess Alexandra Hospital were closed in August 1994. Three operating theatres at Royal Brisbane Hospital were closed in November 1994. And, Mr Speaker, between 1989 and 1995, Premier Rudd, as he thinks of himself, he closed 2,200 beds in order Queensland. The Minister Jimmy's seat. The Honourable Member for Jellybrand, a point of order? Yeah, on a point of order, I would ask that the Minister refer to members by their proper title. The, the member raises a valid point of order. The Minister for Agriculture. The member for Sturt is warned. I call the minister and remind the minister he will refer to members by their title or their seat. Mr Speaker, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, um, these days uh, he says that his greatest hero uh, 
is, uh, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, or it might have been Kia Hardy, depending upon which journalist he's uh, talking to. But, Mr. Speaker, in those days, the Leader of the Opposition was known as Dr. Death. He was known as Dr. Death because he closed 2,200 hospital beds in Queensland, order, order. Mr. Speaker. The, the Minister of MEC, the Manager of Opposition Business. Mr. Speaker, Standing Order 64. The member will resume his seat. The, if, I make the point that uh, if the member finds that expression, if we'd like it withdrawn, I will ask the, for it to be withdrawn. The, the manager of opposition business. Yes, it certainly should be withdrawn, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, obviously. Well, the, well, the member will resume his seat. If it, the member finds it offensive, then the uh, minister will withdraw that last accusation. I'm, I'm a little confused. I simply, I simply referred order, order. to the Queensland public's terminology. Order, order. They the minister has the, the leader call. of the opposition, Dr. Death, because of his record in Queensland public the, hospitals. Now, the, if the leader of the opposition has an objection, he should raise it, and he should let the flunky sit down and stop order, fighting order. this fight for order. him, Mr. Speaker. The minister is in his seat. Members want to hold up their question time, they'll keep interjecting. The honourable member for Dawson was standing first. The member, the member for Dawson was the first to stand. I'll call the member for Dawson. First. Member for Dawson on a point of order. Yes, Mr. Speaker. That term that the minister used was commonly used in the media and in the public in Queensland. He is quoting from the press of the day. The member is The member is your seat. That is not a point of order. The on order order. Members on my left. The what? The member for Lingiari will remove himself under Standing Order 94A. <laughs> no the manager of opposition business. Mr. Speaker, three members on this side have been warned for moving points of order. Two people the, have been excluded, the and for, you allow this for the member come to his point of order. It. That is not a he point of order. He must withdraw it. He must withdraw that statement and withdraw it immediately, without reservation. The, the member will resume his seat, and he will not reflect on the chair. Order. I've, order. The the order. The minister. Mr. Speaker, on the point of order, if the Leader of the Opposition asks me to withdraw because he finds it offensive, I will withdraw. All right. But I'm not going to withdraw the, the, for the this The Minister will resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business, I have heard carefully what the Minister said. If the Leader of the Opposition finds that expression, uh, I, 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 he, he, will, he will ask for it to be withdrawn. The, the Manager of Opposition Business. To the point of order, are you suggesting Mr. Oh, the, Speaker, if the that anyone could not find that offensive, question, could anyone so not afterwards. find that offensive? The, it is offensive. The member it should be seat. The member resume his seat. I've listened carefully, and the the leader has not asked for it to be withdrawn. Therefore, it, he's not found it unparliamentary. I call the minister. The manager of opposition business. Mr. Speaker. You indicated to myself, as manager of opposition business, while the I sat there, would... you indicated directly to me that if there was an objection, it would be withdrawn. If you check the hand side, you will see that that's the what was member said. Will now, the leader his seat. of the house is bringing the member his, resume his seat. I make the point that if the honourable member for Fraser, Paul, Paul. further to that point of order, Mr. Speaker. I know of no precedent where you, 
having asked the minister to withdraw, allow him to refuse and do nothing about it. It's never happened before in all the time I've been in the parliament, and I don't know how you can stand for it. I said, I remind the member for Fraser, I said if the Leader of the Opposition found it offensive, I would ask the member to withdraw it. Order. The member for Fraser. Mr Speaker, that is neither what you said nor what the standing orders the, require. The, the standing member, orders you said— The, the you said, member will not reflect— I, With respect, I'm not, I am reminding you, but I'm not reflecting. Well, the what member, you said was this. You, you said— if the member finds it offensive, I will ask the minister to withdraw. You asked him to withdraw, and he refused. Yeah. When, the what the, is the member will resume his seat, and I will rule on this point of order. The, the, the member will resume his seat. The, the member is well aware that the time to ask questions of the speaker is after question time. Order. The member will resume his seat. The member will resume his seat until I have ruled on the last point of order. I said if the Leader of the Opposition found that expression offensive, I would ask for it to be withdrawn. The Leader of the Opposition has not asked for it to be withdrawn. The Manager of Opposition Business. Can I refer you to Standing Order? Standing Order 89 says a member must not use offensive words against either House of the Parliament the, or a member of the Parliament. The, Standing Order 90, I'm getting straight to the point of order says all imputations of, imp or of improper motives to a member and all personal reflections on other members shall be considered highly disorderly. Standing Order 91 the, goes the to what action you should— I'm well aware of the standing orders. The, the, mem according to the, standing order. the member will resume his seat, as he's well aware. The occupier of the chair is the determinant of the interpretation of the standing orders on the specific instance I have ruled that if the Leader of the Opposition finds that expression offensive, he would ask for it to be drawn. Does the Leader of the Opposition do, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, does the Leader of the Opposition wish to have that withdrawn? Does the Leader of the Opposition No. Okay. The Honourable Member for Melbourne Port. Under Standing Order 90, I find the Minister's description of the Leader of the Opposition offensive, and I ask that you have him withdraw it. The member will resume his seat. I, have, I, I say to the member, I've just sought the opinion of the person in question, the Leader of the Opposition. He has not asked for it to be withdrawn. I, I call the Minister. The Minister. I have ruled on that point of order. I call the minister. Mr. Speaker, I, 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 simply, I simply make the point that after the leader of the opposition's record in Queensland, there is a clear message to the Australian people: don't let this man wreck Medicare like he wrecked the Queensland public hospitals. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Lilly. My question is to the Treasurer. Why did the Treasurer fail to deny Mr Milne's statement and his destabilising activities in the government? The Honourable the Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, I comprehensively answered this question before. Order. Uh, Order. And I'll do it again. Uh, that uh, if the question is, Mr Speaker, uh, do I think there's risk in the Australian economy, the answer is yes. And, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I will say that to the House and I will say that to the people of Australia, as I just have. There is risk in the Australian economy. And, Mr Speaker, let me repeat, there is so much risk in the Australian economy that you can't trust the Labor Party to run Order, it. Order, the member for Wills. And, Mr Speaker, you're going to hear me say that hundreds, if not the thousands member for Jagger, of Jagger times is worn. between now and the next election. Let me tell you, Mr Speaker, we are stronger now that we don't carry $96 billion worth of debt. We are stronger now that we've had nine surplus budgets. We are stronger now, Mr Speaker, that we've established a future fund. We are stronger now that we've reformed the tax system. We are stronger now that we have work choices. Are we strong enough to withstand a Labor government? No way! The member for Indi. The member for Cowan. 
The member for Cowan is warned. The member for Cowan will remove himself under Standing Order 94A. The Honourable Member for Hinkler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is addressed to the Minister for Trade. Uh, <laughs> Order, the member for Hinkler will come to his question or resume his seat. The, the, me the member for Hinkler. Uh, well, would, would the minister update the house? Order. Would Order. the minister update the house? The member for Banks. Would the minister update the house on the impressive international trading performance of the coal industry in Australia and, it in, and its importance to communities in every state? Are there any threats to this industry, especially in Gladstone and the central Queensland coal fields? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Minister for Trade. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for Hinkley, who has a deep and abiding interest in the in the uh, jobs of coal workers. Order. Uh, the coal industry Order. is particularly important to his electorate, as it is to many other electorates uh, around Australia. The Member uh, for Queens Cornwall. Queensland alone exported $14 billion worth of coal last year, $14 billion worth, and uh, that's a, a very significant contribution to the Queensland economy. I mentioned a couple of days ago that one in eight of Australia's export dollars comes from coal, and in Queensland that figure is very, very much higher, perhaps as much as one in four. And so we rely very much as a nation on the coal industry for our wealth and for our growth and for the progress and development particularly of much of regional Australia. Our clean coal is making an, a, a significant contribution also into reducing greenhouse emissions. And if it were to be replaced by coal from China or other parts of the world, the problems that the world would face in relation to greenhouse issues would be much greater. Mr. Speaker, in this context, it's almost unthinkable that there could be threats to the future of this industry. It's almost unthinkable that there would be people who would want to close that industry down. And yet, Senator Brown has made it absolutely clear that, in his view, the coal mining industry should be phased out in three years and all the coal-fired power stations also closed, closed down in that time. But today he's gone even further, Mr Speaker, to compare Australia's uh, coal mining industry with heroin dealers. Senator Brown said that uh, Australia is like a heroin dealer, feeding the habit of the world's dependence on coal. Now, for Senator Senator Brown to compare Australia's 30,000 workers in the coal industry with heroin dealers, I think, reaches an absolutely new low. That's a disgrace. Let him go to the people of Gladstone and tell them that he's likening them to, uh, to heroin dealers. Now, we could just, uh, as I've said before, dismiss that as being the wacky comments of the Greens, but of course we know that Labor is vigorously pursuing a preference deal with the Greens. They badly want to be on the same truck and on the same platform with the Greens when it comes to the, the, the next election. And the Honourable Member for Kingsford Smith has well and truly let the cat out of the bag when he said that the expansion of the coal industry, as we've seen in the Hunter Valley over the past decade, is a thing of the past, and dismissed coal jobs as merely hypothetical. Now, that's causing even some alarm, we read, in the Labor Party. Uh, Senator Evans. The opposition resource and energy spokesman apparently told the shadow ministry earlier this week uh, that they should, be, they should be aware of repeating the Latham blunder on the forestry industry. And another Labor member is bemoaning how badly the member for Kingsford Smith comments had gone down in the Hunter Valley. And I don't know who the unnamed member was, but I'm sure the member for Hunter 
would be very concerned about the comments of the member for Kingsford Smith in relation to the coal industry. Now, the reality is we've got the Greens demanding an end to this industry, calling coal miners uh, equivalent to heroin uh, uh, traffickers, and we've got the, the Labor Party actively pursuing their preference, uh, preference deal at the next election. Now, this kind of behaviour is a serious threat to the coal industry, an industry which has served this country very substantially. And uh, it's high time Labor disassociated itself from these bids to win the Greens and to endeavour to establish a preference deal with a party with this kind of attitude to one of Australia's great industries. The Honourable Member for Hunter. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence and re refers to the proposed new joint facility. Both he and the Foreign Minister mentioned uh, earlier in question time. Why hasn't the minister followed convention by offering the relevant opposition spokesman a briefing on the proposed Geraldton facility? And why, in his earlier answer, did he fail to mention that, as Labor's defence spokesman, I made it absolutely clear on national radio just before question time that Labor fully supports both existing and proposed Order. Order. joint facilities. Order. Minister, why are you playing party politics with Australia's national security? The Honourable the Minister for Defence. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Hunter for his question and welcome him to the defence uh, portfolio. Order. I, uh, Order. And I have, uh, I have not ever suggested or even implied that the member for Hunter would be the in 25 per cent of Labor MPs who think the US is a threat to Australian security. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the member for Banks, uh, to his credit, uh, whilst not being involved in the defence portfolio particularly, but having a keen interest in uh, the Australia-US alliance, uh, took the initiative to ask me a question about this. Uh, had the member for Hunter been uh, carefully answer, listening to the answer, uh, he would uh, know that I had said that the final negotiations are not yet concluded. Uh, when, those, uh, when the memorandum of understanding uh, is uh, finally— <coughs> Order! The member for Lilly has already been warned. When the memorandum of understanding uh, is finally signed and agreed by the United States of America, of course uh, he will be welcome to complete uh, disclosure. But if, in the meantime, he would like uh, even further information than I have made available to the member for Banks, he will be most, uh, will be most pleased to receive it. And I must say I do welcome, I do welcome although it uh, appears to have taken in the vicinity of some uh, six or seven hours, I do welcome the Labor Party's support for a US-based facility in Australia. Order. The Honourable Member for Hunter. Well, Mr Speaker, I'll deal with that later by way of a personal order, explanation, order. but I seek leave to table the transcript in which I make it quite clear some hours ago, some hours order, ago order, order. The, that the, Labor fully is supports the, member the facilities. Leave? Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Macmillan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Environment and Water Resources. Would the minister inform the House how the Australian government is investing in clean coal as a part of its comprehensive climate change strategy? Is the minister aware of any alternative plans? The Honourable the Minister for Environment and Water Resources. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Macmillan for the question. His commitment to the coal industry and to clean coal is well known and the benefits of our, our investment in clean coal technology will be felt particularly in his electorate. The Australian government has committed $2 billion to climate change mitigation, and we are getting results. We are going to meet our Kyoto target. By 2010, Mr Speaker, there will be 87 million less tonnes of carbon in our atmosphere. That is equivalent to the total emissions of the entire transport sector. This is being achieved by investment in a range of projects, renewables, but above all, we are focused on clean coal. And why is that? Because coal is the world's most abundant energy source. It dominates 
the energy sources of the world's most active and growing economies. China, India, 70 per cent dependent on coal. They need coal. They have coal. We have to help them clean it up, and we are helping them do that. We have invested more than $410 million in projects and technologies to clean up coal, including Mr. Speaker, in the world's single largest carbon capture and storage project. We are working with China through the AP6, through the bilateral relationship, because unless China can get the energy it needs and have the technology to enable it to reduce its emissions, all of us know that no matter what we do here, no matter what hardships we endure, they will have no effect on global warming. Cooperation, clean coal, technology is vital to our future. But what are the alternative views? Well, we have the Greens policy. Senator Brown proposes that we should shut down the Australian coal industry. Uh, the member for Kingsford Smith has said that the expansion of the coal industry in the Hunter Valley is a thing of the past. When he's asked, when he's asked what is the impact of your, of your climate change policies on jobs going to be, he says that's a hypothetical question. When he's asked out by a reporter out of sheer frustration trying to get a response, when he said, does this mean we will have to pay more for our energy, the member for Kingsford Smith says, I don't know what pay more means. Mr Speaker, it's not just on US bases that he is coy. He won't answer a question on anything. Mr Speaker, I've looked uh, carefully to see why the, where the precedents are for the policies of the opposition on for this big 60 per cent unilateral cut in emissions. What are they looking at? What are the examples? What's the history? Well, there have been two groups of countries which have had enormous reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Russia. Russia's emissions dropped 25 per cent between 1990 and 2004. Why was that? Total economic collapse. Inflation of more than 11,700 per cent. A halving of GDP. And by 2004, there's still 15 per cent below 1990 uh, GDP in real terms. So that's one example. If you want to cut greenhouse gases dramatically, slam your economy into the ground, impoverish your country, shut down your industry. Well, maybe that's the example that the member for Kingsford Smith is, is looking at. But there could be another, because he, they don't just look to Hugo Chavez for political inspiration. What about Margaret Thatcher? Britain. Britain. In 2004, Order. Britain's, emissions, Order. Britain's emissions were down by 15 per cent. So how did, how did Britain achieve 15 per cent reduction in emissions? I'll tell you how they achieved it, Mr Speaker. They shut down the coal industry. And the member for Hunter should listen to this, because his constituents include many descendants and relatives of British coal miners. In 1990, Britain produced 100 million tonnes of coal. This year it will produce 20 million tonnes of coal. Order, the member for 280,000 workers in the British coal industry in 1990, today 10,000. And now Britain is importing coal itself. So there it is, two choices. Who does the member for Kingsford Smith want to be? Does he want to be Bob Brown in government or play Margaret Thatcher to the coal workers of Australia? Either way, it's a grim prospect for our greatest export industry. The Honourable Member for Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Jellybrand. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Didn't the Minister yesterday tell the House that, according to Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, a state government expenditure on dental services decreased from $374 million to $327 million between 2000 and 2004. Didn't the minister wrongly use the out-of-date projected figures when the most recent Australian Institute of Health and Welfare data in this report shows the real figure is an increase from $374 million to $503 million? Oh. Oh. 
Why has the minister again blamed the states, and why have you misled the House? Order. 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 The, the member for McKellar. Allegation misleading the House, that's a substantive issue and should be so dealt with. Order. The, I was listening carefully to the member for Jellybrand. Had she used the expression deliberately, yes, it would have certainly been out of order. I call the Minister for Health and Ageing. Mr Speaker, I'm amazed that the member for Jellybrand is there defending the state's performance in public dental health. The member for Jellybrand, order. The member for Jellybrand has been the first to order. claim the member for that there are 650,000 650, people on public the dental waiting lists in is Australia, and now, and now she wants to defend that performance. Order. She wants to defend the performance the performance of the state government will put 650,000 people on public dental waiting lists. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the answer, the member the answer for I gave, is warned. the answer I gave was based on the advice I had. Uh, it was the it was, a, it was the best advice I had at the time. Mr. Order. The Honourable Member for Jellybrand. Yes, Mr Speaker, I seek leave to table the document found in the Parliamentary Library in case his staff need it. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for McKellar. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Order. Would, would the Minister confirm the importance of regular holidays to the health of ordinary Australian workers, particularly workers in my electorate? Can the minister provide details of how the health of workers and money which could be spent on courses to improve their health has been jeopardised? Can he describe how this has happened and any justification that has been given, and what is the government's response? The Honourable Minister for Health and Ageing. Mr Speaker, I do thank the member for McKellar for her question, and I certainly accept that regular rest and recreation the member for Lowe. is very important for health, uh, particularly for the health of workers, and Mr. Speaker, uh, for more than 50 years, for more than 50 Order. years, thousands of workers had healthy holidays at Unions New South Wales holiday retreat, Currawong, on Pitwater in the electorate of McKellar. But, Mr. Speaker, not anymore. Not anymore. Unions New South Wales has just sold Currawong to a developer, Order. no less, Mr. Speaker. But they didn't sell it for 30 million dollars. The as member for Sydney, bidder, as one bidder uh, offered, they didn't sell it for $25 million, as Macquarie Bank offered. They ended up selling it for $15 million in one of the most mysterious deals of recent times. And, Mr. Speaker, this certainly is uh, going to damage workers' health because uh, the courses on occupational health and safety previously run at Karawong can't go ahead. I looked at the ACTU website uh, just today and it says the sale of Karawong uh, means that we are, and I quote, therefore unable to guarantee at this stage that residential courses on health and safety will go ahead. And Mr Speaker, I discovered from Piers Ackerman's article in the Daily Telegraph today that the entity advising Order. unions New South Wales Order. was also, through a complicated corporate structure, the entity, Order. the entity that was actually purchasing the site, Mr. Speaker. So there is a clear, a clear conflict of interest in this sale that is going to damage the health of workers in New South Wales. I also discovered that the same person who controlled the entity advising New South Wales also controlled a part purchaser of the site. And, Mr. Speaker, this gentleman, uh, Mr. Alan Lintz had been a fellow director with Union's New South Wales boss John Robertson of a company called Kingsway Capital, whose directors also included New South Wales Treasurer Michael Costa and New South Wales Labor Secretary Mark Arbib, a clear case of potential insider trading, Mr Speaker. Now, Mr Speaker, I ask, I ask this House, I ask the people of New South Wales, I ask the honest unionists of New South Wales where are the missing millions, Mr Speaker? Why did, the, why did Unions New South Wales sell this property for $15 million less than they could?
could have had. Now, Mr. Speaker, this deal has scam written all over it, Mr. Speaker. And I call on the New South Wales Police Fraud Squad to investigate the links between Mr. Lintz uh, and senior New South Wales figures, and I particularly call on the New South Wales Fraud Squad to investigate why one of the purchasing entities order, order, was order. a company the, registered in the British the Virgin Minister, Islands. The Minister will resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Jellybrand, a point of order? Yes, on a point of order. If the Minister truly thinks that some criminal activity has been undertaken, he should be reporting it to the police, not to the Parliament. The That's right. Minister resume, a member will resume his seat. I'm listening carefully to the Minister. He was asked a question about health workers. <laughs> And I believe he's, he is certainly in order. I call him Minister. Who are the and I would Mr. also Speaker, point out, I would also Mr. Point Mr. out that Mr. the Minister may wish to do the, uh, what the member for Jellybrand requested uh, and, and as well. And Mr. Speaker, you can you can be quite confident that I will be doing just that, Mr. Speaker, because Mr. Speaker, I am concerned order. about scams which damage the health of the workers of New South Wales and members opposite particularly the Leader of the Opposition, who likes to give little unctuous lectures to people about standards. He Leader. needs to explain why it is that Unions New South Wales entered into a deal that involved a company registered in the British Virgin Islands, no less, one of the world's most mo notorious tax havens involving people whose, director, who, whose, whose ownership is a deep, dark secret because of that registration. Now, Mr Speaker, who are the shareholders here? Yeah. Who are the beneficiaries Very here? What is the relationship between senior Labor Party officials in yeah. New South Wales yeah. in this deal? And where did that $15 million yeah. go? We deserve some answers, yeah. Mr Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Honourable Member for Fraser. Very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Is the Acting Prime Minister aware that in the last 48 hours at least six of his Cabinet colleagues used blame the states as an excuse for effective action in response to dental health, disability support, Indigenous policing, schools, roads and journalist protection? Order. Order. When will the government accept that Australians are sick of that blame game? Order. Members on my right. The Honourable the Acting Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for his question. Uh, 20 million Australians expect their national government to govern this nation in the national interest. And if, there are, if there are circumstances within this country that need to be identified that are not in the national interest, then they, they expect us to identify them. Just as this government Order. has the member for the responsibility— is just as this government has shouldered the responsibility for the last 11 years of fixing up the mess that the Labor Party left us after being in office for 13 years, and while we've got a bunch of state Labor governments dragging the nation down, we will continue to identify their fallacies and what they're doing in their policies. Now, the Labor Party, led by the new Leader of the Opposition, uh, can squawk all they like about the blame game. The reality is Australians want this country run properly whether it's at a federal level, at a state Order. level or at a local government level. They expect the dollars that we are deploying on their behalf to be spent wisely. The member for they expect is warned. the country to be run properly. We have continued over the last 11 years and so in the, the face of opposition on, at every turn by the Australian Labor Party to fix up the mess that they left us. And if the, if the state Labor governments continue to make a mess behind them, we will continue to talk about it, Mr Speaker. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we are expected to run this country in the national interest. So, if the member for Fraser wants to ask questions about why do ministers continue to blame state governments where they are wrong, where it's their area of the responsibility, we are going to continue to do that. We are going to continue to do that. We will still, we will hold, Order. we will hold the Labor Party to account for the mess that they left this country in 11 years ago and the hard work that we've had to do to fix it up. We will hold to account the state Labor governments in Australia who continue to drag this country down when the rest of the country is trying to move forward, Mr Speaker. So in answer to the member's question, we will continue to identify bad policy, bad decisions whenever they stick their head up. And on that note, I'll ask that further questions be put on the notice paper. I thank the Acting Prime Minister.